Good morning and a warm welcome to the National Gallery of Art on this first day of autumn, the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness and hurricanes. I'm Emily Pegues, Assistant Curator of Sculpture and Decorative Arts, and I'm thrilled to see so many truly devoted poetry lovers assembled here today. Today is an historic day. You'll be hearing for the very first time the world premiere of nine new poems written by nine incredible poets. We invited these esteemed writers and thinkers to choose any work of art that spoke to them, giving them no guidance except to choose something in the East Building. Their responses offer profound new insights, which may change how you see the art, and their poems represent a wonderful new contribution to American literature. The word ekphrastic comes from the Greek to describe, and to write an ekphrastic poem is to look closely, to pay attention, to notice. Ekphrasis models a way of close looking and feeling how art makes you respond. It extends the conversation begun by visual art and I hope many of you will be inspired to craft your own response to the art that speaks to you. In the spirit of paying fo focused attention, and as we're recording this program, may I ask you to please turn off your cell phone and other ringing devices. Thank you. A few logistics. After I introduce our keynote speaker, she will read and discuss her poem for around 45 minutes, and afterwards there should be time for a few questions. Following her reading, please consult your festival brochure for the rest of the day's lively schedule. We will keep to the start times for each reading. Please note that seating will be first come, first served throughout the afternoon. This program has been made possible by a grant from the Alice L. Walton Foundation. We wish to, make, we wish to thank the many people who made this festival of word and image possible. Vaughn Fielder, founder of the Field Office and representative for Ada Limon. Ms. Limon honored Vaughn in her inaugural reading as Poet Laureate as her twin, without whom I could not do this at all, and the National Gallery seconds that sentiment about Vaughn's contribution to our programming. Thanks to Kate Haw, Harry Cooper, and Emily Francisco for their early and unwavering support, Yuri Long and Sarah Osborne Bender, for the library exhibition of poetry treasures and inspiration for the bookmaking work workshop upstairs. Rio DeNaro for her design of the free booklet, printing all of these poems for the very first time. Gigi Bradford, chair of the Folger Shakespeare Library Poetry Board and poetry teacher extraordinaire, whose teaching and input inspired and influenced at the earliest stages, the wish to bring poets and poetry to the National Gallery and to wonderful colleagues, Rachel Tanzi and the extraordinary Ali Peel, whose detailed and collaborative work and poetic imaginations created this absolute joyous gift of a public program. It is an enormous privilege and honor to introduce Ada Limon, 24th Poet Laureate of the United States. Ada Limon is the author of six books of poetry, including The Carrying, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry. Her most recent book of poetry, The Hurting Kind, is now out from Milkweed Editions. As the Poet Laureate, her signature project is called You Are Here and focuses on how poetry can help us connect to the natural world. While she is deeply immersed in thinking about our place in nature, her poetic explorations are not confined to Earth. In June of this year, she premiered a poem commissioned by NASA which will be engraved in her handwriting on a plaque carried aboard the Europa Clipper spacecraft. Entitled In Praise of Mystery, A Poem for Europa, her words will travel 1.8 billion miles aboard the spacecraft set to launch in October 2024 on its voyage to Jupiter and its moons. She is truly a celestial poet. In June of 2022, Librarian of Congress Carla Hayden appointed Ada Limon to be the 24th Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, also known as the U.S. Poet Laureate. The position has existed as part of the Library of Congress for over 80 years and was named by an act of Congress. To find out more about the laureateship, you can visit the library's website. Please join us in welcoming Ada Limon. Hello, hello, and welcome. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Emily. It is such a pleasure to be in one of the most beautiful galleries in the world. Um, and such a pleasure to be with some of my favorite writers um, who have just made extraordinary poems in response to extraordinary pieces of art. Um, 
I um, am giving a talk, which is always so interesting to me because I'm like, oh, I have to honor the sentence. I'm like, what, what is that about? The sentence. I work in lines. I work in little tiny syllables and how they sound. Um, but I have printed it out for you. Um, otherwise, I will ramble, um, as you might have already noticed. Um, and in fact, on the way here, I asked the person at the front desk if they would mind printing the updated version, because of course, like any poet, I was revising up until the moment. And um, they put it in a little uh, folder for me. And I said, oh, great. Thank you so much. And he looked at me and goes, you should check it. <laughs> and I thought I was so trusting. I was like, oh, I'm just going to like take this folder and leave. Um, but yes, there are all the pages here. Thanks. Thanks to their um, their advice. I did check it. It would have been funny if I was opening it. And it was like some congressional report or something. Um, then I, then you would have to hear me ramble. Um, so this is a this is a, a talk um, that I created just for this space and just for this event. Um, and uh, I think in many ways I work against wisdom, <laughs> against advice, and in this case, against knowing. So this talk is titled "The Case for Unknowing: To Be Moved." by feeling. A long time ago, when I was going through a breakup, oh, let's start with a little heartbreak, shall we? Poets always like to start off the conversation with a little heartbreak. I was living in New York City. I took myself to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and wandered around from room to room, trying to take all of the art in as fast as I could trying to outrun whatever I was feeling. I'd avoid famous paintings with crowds around them and sometimes slowly trail an organized tour, gleaning whatever I could from the tour guide who eyed me suspiciously as not a member of their carefully counted group. Art was what I needed when I couldn't name what I was feeling, but I wanted to feel something aside from whatever it was. I wanted to be moved. I love the phrase, be moved. It implies a physical reaction, to be moved by something, almost as if shoved or shaken. I like the image of a poem or a painting moving someone, as if it reaches out with some sort of amorphous, fiery limb and shakes them. And after we are moved, we are in a new place, a new emotional state. Perhaps we are more open or perhaps we are more torn asunder. Either way, we are moved. After hours of numbly gliding through the walls of art, the halls of sculptures, the temple of Tendor, writing sad notes in my sad journal, I rounded a corner and saw the painting by Jennifer Bartlett called Air. 24 hours, 5 p.m. It's a seven foot by seven foot oil on canvas painting that depicts fish swimming in a lily pond with a painted grid superimposed over it. It's both the natural world and the organized rigidity of humanity's grind. I had no idea who she was. I didn't know her as an artist or a novelist. I only knew that something in the painting moved me. I loved how the fish seemed to be both swimming below and above the grid, but also not caring about the grid at all. I stood there for a long time and the painting shifted. It showed me things, new patterns, new fish, new relationships between them. The fish seemed to come alive, swim into corners and blur. And while I can't say my heart was healed afterwards, I can say I left feeling as if I understood something, a calm below the surface, a rigidity that was self-imposed, the ridiculous the ridiculousness of thinking that I was separate from nature itself. Of course, this was not the first time I was moved by a painting. 
or the visual arts, but it stood out to me because it felt as if it shifted my consciousness somehow. I can remember that moment, the painting, the light coming in, the way the world seemed to find stillness so completely, it's almost like a physical place I can visit in my mind. In a world where we often crave certainty and clear sides, might I say, what a gift to have your mind changed, altered, rinsed out, and reassembled. A side note here. Poets also love side notes. Is that every time I think of the painting, I call it rush hour. It is called air, 24 hours, 5 p.m. But I was living in New York and 5 p.m. is rush hour. And the fish, the grid, the smooth calm under the water, the absurdity of time, well, I remember it always as the painting called Rush Hour in my head because it's called Rush Hour. <laughs> and what's more ironic is that it's not even called Rush Hour. Look how the slipperiness of art interpretation rolls into the slipperiness of language. This is not the first time I have unnamed or renamed a thing. I find myself often replacing a phrase and remembering things incorrectly. The Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges wrote of memory, we are our memory. We are that chimerical museum of shifting shapes, the pile of broken mirrors. My memory is a pile of broken mirrors. But it often makes me realize that experiencing art isn't just about seeing, it's about feeling. And what I bring into the room with me that I'm going through when I walk, sorry, what I'm going through before I even walk into the room, what I'm open to is going to inform what I take away from that experience. My connection to visual arts, whether it's painting or sculpture or collage, is one that begins before trips to museums and galleries. My mother is a painter, and we've collaborated on all six of my books where she's painted the covers after reading the work. It's one of the luckiest collaborations of my life. When I was younger, she was a ceramicist. In Glen Allen, California, my mother had a studio behind our house, and I used to sit on top of the manual potter's wheel while my brother made it go round and round with his feet until I delight in all the dizziness. I loved seeing the world through a blur. The trees all around me on Arnold Drive, the oaks blending into one massive archway of almost mythical limbs. When my mother was working on something in her studio, she became introverted, myopic. But she always welcomed us in to see what she was doing, what she was making. I loved seeing how a thing was made, how it was formed. It didn't make sense to me, but to know what went into something as seemingly simple as a vase, a plate, a bowl, a teacup, a drawing, it always fascinated me. Later in her studio in Sonoma, California, she became more of a painter, using oils and acrylics on canvas and playing loud music into the evenings and making large, colorful paintings that filled the walls, that took up space. I loved watching how she saw the world, which was different than how I saw the world. I saw it in memories, in language, in emotional attachments. She saw it in vibrations, in movements, in lines, and form. She gave attention to things through inking and rendering and could show me the ways that shadows fell, how shadows were the real lines, the way the lines fell away and blurred when the light left. I realized looking at the shapes of things meant looking at the shadows. We lived in an apartment above the studio and the gallery. At La Haye Art Gallery, I would spend hours after school visiting artists in their studios. I'm sure 
I annoyed them with all of my questions. Sitting on a stool, twisting around, asking why this glaze was this color, or why the bronze was always poured into a mold, the glaze, the bronze, why the plaster came first, or wondering why glass would bend sometimes, but not always. It was there that I learned that art wasn't always about clear ideas, but it was a way of being in the relationship with the world, a releasing of something back to the universe. Personally, I was never good at making art, or I wasn't good at drawing or painting or making clay sculptures. I never had the patience for it or the technical skill. Drawings never looked like what I saw in my head. And so for a long time, I didn't even think of myself as an artist. Even when I became a poet, I thought the two worlds were bifurcated, the world of visual language, the world of visual art, each in their own world, never touching. I didn't know how wrong I was. I have always been curious as to why we make things, why we want to make things, the impulse behind our urge to speak back to the world, to not just receive it, but to offer something back to it. Where does it come from? Why do we feel the need to share it? It seems like it's not only about responding to what we see or feel or sense, but it's also about connecting to others, to showing other human beings what our response is. We somehow need to make our inner world, our inner perceptions known to others. It's not only about skill or talent, but about desire. Georgia O'Keeffe once said, I said to myself, I have things in my head that are not like what anyone has taught me, shapes and ideas near to me, so natural to my own way of being and thinking that it hasn't occurred to me to put them down. I decided to start anew, to strip away what I had been taught. I love that quote because it reflects that there is an inner world that is essential to understanding the outer world. It's not about learning or studying, although all of those things are deeply essential to the growth of an artist but it's also about honoring your own strange way of perceiving, to know ourselves deeply. I have often maintained that to know ourselves is to know nature, and to know nature is to know ourselves. As Carl Jung once wrote, whenever we touch nature, we get clean. People who have gotten dirty through too much civilization take a walk into the woods or bathe in the sea. Entering the unconscious, entering yourself through dreams is touching nature from the inside. And this is the same thing. Things are put right again. And it is the same thing. To go to the woods is not unlike entering one's own dreamscape. To look at art, to really be present with an artistic expression can be similar to both of these journeys. This is how we discover awe and what it means to us. So many studies over the last 20 years these days have pointed to our need for awe in our lives, especially as our world changes, as climate catastrophes continue, as life changes exponentially from one year to the next. Where do we find awe? We find it in nature, of course, in the national parks, in the trees in our backyard, the night sky, the stars, the planets, but also in poems, in paintings, in sculptures. Awe makes us feel small, which might not be what you think you need to feel. Who wants to feel small? I guess what I'm saying is, I do. I do want to feel small. This is when my friends and family can say, Ada, you're five foot two. You are small. <laughs> but of course, I mean, feeling small into the relationship of our larger connectedness. The truth is we spend so much time in our minds, in our urgent microcosm of needs, whether it's a terrible national crisis that's affecting us personally or a family's health concern, the death of a parent or a friend, or simply a work dispute that's causing more agitation than it should. 
We sometimes simply need to widen the lens to see ourselves in relationship to not just our community, but to humanity. And sometimes to not just humanity, but to the planet, to the universe. And in some ways, being in awe, feeling that sense of a widening lens, that's a kind of freedom, a freedom to have no answers, to not know anything for certain. If you are standing in a forest, you can't know what is coming or know all the mysteries that will take place between the trees. Even the most skilled arborist or forest pathologist can't tell you all the mysteries of trees. And would you even want to know them? All the secrets? Please do not tell me all the secrets of trees. I don't deserve them. At least I don't deserve them yet. Rather, let that be my gift at the very end of a very long life. And maybe sometimes the reason we make things is not to reveal secrets or mysteries, but point out that they exist. Poetry and art can mirror nature in that way, can say, look how weird this is. This human being walking in the world, an animal wearing clothes. How strange, how odd every little movement, molecule and breath to stand in communion with things that have no answer, but instead make room for an unknowing can not only bring us a sense of ease, but can bring us back to ourselves again like the Jennifer Bartlett painting that is not called Rush Hour. And yet it is still called Rush Hour in my mind. It can still remind us that we are not the forced grid on top of our lives, but the fish underneath it swimming by instinct and hunger. When we make a case for art and poetry, a case for nature and for all, we are also in many ways making a case for unknowing. So many people I know feel intimidated by art or poetry because they don't feel like they can understand it or they don't think they have the right education or upbringing to understand a poem. Very often I ask them simply, how did it make you feel? I love this question because we should ask that of everyone about everything. How did it make you feel? And sometimes the answer is not easy. It made me feel annoyed <laughs> or irritated because I don't understand it. And that's fair. That is remarkably fair. I have felt that way about many poems and pieces of art. I could rant for hours against poetry that seems only interested in the ego or poetry that seems only interested in making someone else uncomfortable or feel unintelligent. In fact, I'd argue that if you ever want to hear anyone really rant against poetry, ask a poet. Any jaded poet could out rant a newbie poet, poetry hater, by miles and still turn around the argue in favor of the often maligned and sometimes sidelined art form. But the most annoying thing that we do as a poet well, I don't know if it's the most annoying. One of the most annoying things we do as a poet is an artist do the same thing and naturalists do the same thing. We say, look closer, look again, read it again, look again. We say, what else is there? Until suddenly, almost always, something new happens. That something new is different to everyone but it does happen and we can't explain it. Just the other day, I was doing yoga in a foul mood. Doing, doing yoga in a foul mood is actually hysterical because here you are in a mat. In my case, I'm outside on a lovely screened in porch. I'm moving my body, I'm deep breathing and I've got this furrowed brow that seems to say that all of this must be some kind of suffering. I mean, to be, a human in a body is to be alive, is one could argue at some point, some kind of suffering. But still on this particular day, I was not actually suffering. I was just thinking too much. And what I needed to do, uh, 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 sorry, thinking too much about what I needed to do and what was required of me instead of being in my body. I decided to stop doing yoga and instead 
do some meditation. I often look at the back of the yard where the tree line is full of overgrown honeysuckle and tangled mulberry leaf tree limbs. I closed my eyes and took a couple of grumpy deep breaths. Grumpy breathing is as hilarious as grumpy yoga. Suddenly, when I opened my eyes, I saw that the trees were all moving. This is not a UAP story nor is it any unexplained phenomenon. It's just what happens when you breathe and look at nature at the same time. I could suddenly see all the birds in the trees and bushes, and it was so busy with life. A rabbit that we have nicknamed the agent of chaos for how he has eaten my entire garden, jumped out of the asters, and a jay made crazy noises in the crab apple tree. I'm not saying it was peaceful. I'm saying it was alive. That same thing happens with art. There is a professor of music in Indiana named Phil Ford who has an exercise with his students where he asks them to go to a museum, choose a piece of artwork to experience, and pay homage to it, whether it's a bow or a kneeling or a nod in some way recognize that you are entering its space and then stare at it for about a half an hour. He says this exercise has never failed to produce almost otherworldly results. People have profound and often deeply emotional reactions, not to mention a deep attachment to the art piece itself. This kind of deep looking, looking with intention, allows for a communing to take place. Even the act of bowing and acknowledging all of this with intention, here we are, this place is sacred. When I was moving through the Met as quickly as possible, trying to outrun my heartbreak, trying to see all the art in blurry drive by, neither here nor there, I was almost guaranteed to not be moved. How could I be? I wasn't allowing myself to be in community with the work. I was only who I was, a little busted up, a little thirsty, quite possibly tired from staying up too late. And I wanted to be moved, but I wasn't even pausing long enough to look. This art professor, Professor Ford, mentions this that artists often ask you to do. We want you to spend time with a poem, with an album, with a sculpture, and have an experience with it. And the key here is that the experience does not have to contain judgment. You cannot be wrong or right for that matter. While most people will give advice to not take things too personally, which is great advice for most things, don't take social media too personally. Don't take an offhand comment too personally. Don't take the cat's side eye too personally. Those things aren't personal, but art, hey, guess what? This is where you get to take it personally. It is personal. Like tasting wine or picking a favorite color, you get to have your own experience. And everything becomes more vibrant once you let go of any obligatory meaning. Meditation teacher and scholar Joseph Goldstein recently said that he stopped using words like watch or notice or observe as much when he's teaching mindfulness, instead uses the word feeling. To notice yourself walking is one thing, but to feel yourself walking is another. He said the word feeling immediately drops you into yourself in a slightly deeper way. When folks are seeking spiritual wisdom, whether it's through religion or philosophy or psychedelics, they're often looking not to be stuck in the objective realm, to go beyond the material reality of our lives. While often religion and philosophy are trying to name the thing, sometimes even searching for certainty, art is doing the opposite. In poetry and art, we have the term defamiliarization that came from a 1917 essay by Viktor Shlovsky called Art as Device or Brecht, Brecht's Alienation Effect or Estrangement. All of these terms could take a whole separate talk 
and go on to explore. But I love the idea of essentially making something mundane, something we might take for granted as fully known to us, and allow it to become unknown, to be made strange. If anyone knows my work, you'll know that people often talk about my accessibility in poetry. But what people don't speak about is my strangeness, my weirdness in my work. The weirdness is where I find my freedom. Although, like most artists, I know nothing is stranger than our own human experience. Perhaps I'm saying that I want all of us to become more comfortable with an unknowing, to trust that our emotional or instinctual response is enough, that there is a wisdom in our own receiving that doesn't always have to be over-intellectualized or use the language of critics that often feels more performative than it does useful. If you don't know the names of trees, you can still stand in a forest and be in awe. If you don't know what materials a painting is made of, you can still stare at it until it becomes wholly known to you. The same is true of poetry. In order to find awe in our lives, we must simply be willing to look closely and with intention. This perhaps will allow us to be moved. When I first encountered Andy Goldsworthy's work, it seemed in many ways to combine my two favorite forms of awe, the awe that we receive from the natural world and the awe that we receive from art. I remember thinking that it made complete sense to me that he often chose to put his artworks and sculptures in natural spaces made out of natural elements, the idea of the two worlds being united, all of it clicked into place a root finding its water source, a bee its flower. Growing up near the Sonoma coast, we used to head to the beach quite a lot as kids. Of course, if you know anything about Northern California coast, you know that the water is very cold. Even if it's hot inland, once you reach Bodega Bay, the layers of fog will send you shivering to your car for your sweatshirt. It isn't a swimming beach, although as a child, we'd throw our bodies into any shark-infested icy water because it was the beach and we were children. But often we'd spread out a blanket and wrap in our sweatshirts and sometimes sleeping bags. We'd nap and play games. If we were with my mother, a game meant to make a sculpture. That could be a sandcastle, but the sandcastles would be more impressionistic. It would feel like a spell, often dome-like with circles of rocks formed in various connected curvatures. It would include feathers or sea glass or anything we could find. My mother was used to working with clay, could form some sort of dripping spires that look both man-made and nature-made all at once. I love those spell-like castles. When I first discovered Andy Goldsworthy's work, it felt as if the dream of those castles were finally being fulfilled, realized in a mind of genius and with wild and free imagination. I followed his work for years, The Storm King, the work in the Presidio in San Francisco, the books I loved flipping the pages and imagined someday making something just like that sculptures that were homages to nature and often set inside of nature, the worlds of all coming together in unison. When I chose Roof as what I wanted poetically to respond to during this event, I had no idea how attached I would become to this piece. Like the students in Professor Ford's class, I became emotionally connected to Roof while I stared and studied before attempting the poem. For the non-poets in the room, we call a poem that speaks to an art piece an ekphrastic poem, as Emily mentioned in her introduction, which simply means a poem that responds to a work of art. As a side note, I have poetry friends that have made fake ekphrastic poems, which are poems written for a work of art that they imagined. I love this because it proves that even in our most intellectually stimulated, we poets still like to push the boundaries of meaning. 
Roof to me is not only an exceptional piece because of its materials and size, but also because of where it is. Here, built in the incredible National Gallery, yes, but also in our nation's capital. It is hard not to wander anywhere here in Washington, D.C. and not think about history, power, generational legacies. Just down the street, my office, or rather the office of the Poet Laureate, in the Jefferson Building at the Library of Congress, overlooks the Capitol. From the balcony view, you can see the dome glowing against the skyline. Incidentally, on my first tour of the Library of Congress, I learned that when it was restored, the dome took three coats of 400 gallons each of paint. The paint, no joke, is called dome white. It is hard to stand in that office and not be struck by the weight of history, collective and individual history. From that window, I've watched as the Capitol Police have put up boundaries or the tourists take photos. Above it all, even above the trees, is the dome. So what struck me first about Goldsworthy's piece, Roof, is that, of course, it is made up of the dome form. But instead of something towering, it is low to the earth. And instead of being painted in a bright, high wattage dome white, they are earthen and made of slate. They are made of the earth itself. There's something how the understated power of them, the way they are both man-made, but also feel like large, beautiful wasp nest, something they could only be formed by nature itself. The other thing that struck me almost immediately is that there is a hole in each of them that opens to the sky. The circle looms large everywhere in this piece. The circle is honored. Because it honors the circle, it also feels uniquely feminine in some way. The softness of the curves, the sturdiness that feels both rooted and emerging at the same time. But once again, why speak in prose and honor the sentence when poetry does the better work of the imagination? Here is my piece that I hope gives you a sense of unknowing, a sense of wonder, and allows you to look at Goldsworthy's roof again and with reverence. In the end, everything gives. What is above us? The bleary algorithm of patterns, leaves, towering history of law and lore, outside the gates, the chaotic hush of flesh and bone, a kind of clamoring cannon fire or a brass band, a choir of tree limbs asking, what have we made? Who holds you? Where resides our genius? our courageousness of action, name the glory, rename the glory, pin it down in a book of legacies, ink and stone. There is a word that returns to me, realm. Someone on a train shrugs cartoonish, what gives? And the answer is everything. Everything gives way. The shorelines, the house decaying and becoming shrub and moss and haunt, the body that gives and gives until it cannot give any more. When sleepless as a child, my mother would draw my face, not with charcoal or oil paints, but with her fingers, simply circling my features. Here are your eyes. Here are your eyebrows, your nose, your mouth, your chin, and your whole face round and round. This is you. This was when I understood boundaries, that she could see my shapes, and I was made of circles, and she was made of circles. All of us modest etchings in the landscape, a fingernail dug into the side of a tree, little winces, let me count the ways, let me count the days. All the circles of us end eventually. The light is its own story. When there is a hole in a roof, what is the roof? The roof is the sky itself. Maybe that's the real story, neither one belonging to each other. There is a word that returns again, realm. I sat by a train window and traced my palm when I missed my mother. 
I was giving myself a circle. This is your palm, a circle, which is also nature, a strangeness that is you. What is grandeur? Who is keeping score? I believe in the circle, in light that surprises me, when I can believe nothing. The palm reaching out is a gesture, a boundary, a circle one could slip through, or something you could hold, and in turn, it could hold you back. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just close with this one paragraph and then we can open it up to questions. You will notice that I have resisted telling you what roof means exactly. And you will notice that I have resisted telling you what my poem means exactly. Why would you want to know anything exactly? Instead, let us witness and watch how two things move together. And the rest of the day, I hope you do this, how they make you feel. There is value in feeling and how something makes you feel that's enough. And if for a moment you think, I don't know what either of them mean, that's wonderful. You win. Hooray for not knowing. That just means we are alive. There is no answer, no thinking that can unravel the mystery of the world. And I, for one, hold that close. The only thing I know is not knowing. Maybe together we can let the unknowing be enough that simply being here in a space where art is alive, letting ourselves feel alive, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's how we can and will be moved. Thank you. Um, how are you guys doing? Is that okay? You feel okay? You feel welcomed into the day? Welcomed into the space. Yeah, moving around. You could do some grumpy yoga. Um, I'm happy to, um, we have a few minutes. I'm happy to take questions. If anyone has a question, I can repeat it up here if I can hear it in the first place. I just looked over here. I literally said, does anyone have any questions? And then I just started staring like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's. I love that you say that. The question um, was whether or not I sort of delved into um, Andy Goldsworthy's history, his his biography, his life, other artworks, whatever it was, and how did I then enter the poem from there? Um, I actually knew knew a little bit. Um, my mother had his books when I was growing up, so I knew at least the works. Um, but I tried to avoid making I was a, a my biggest thing was that I didn't want to respond to the man to the person which I think because all of us love stories that's very easy to do right is to respond immediately to like oh this is Miles Davis as a human right versus Miles Davis's work and those things are very complicated and very different <laughs> and so I think that um I really wanted to in some ways stay true to the purity of the art form itself almost as if it was separate um oh hello um and so uh so I think that was a big part of it was I mean I knew enough I think um but I but I didn't really delve in too much to making it about him and I think it's too easy to do that because I'm such a storyteller <laughs> yeah thank you for that anything else another one yeah
Yeah. Yeah, um, I love that question. Um, you know, the question was uh, if I had other works that responded to pieces of art. And um, the question also made it clear that a lot of my poems respond to the natural world, which is very true. Um, and I think that I would say that, you know, I have had the the gift of responding to a couple of pieces um, I've responded to some work from Frida Kahlo um, at um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, which has been a real gift and, and wonder. Uh, and so I actually have quite, quite a few collections of ekphrastic poems. It's interesting, though, because they've never fit in any of my books because they are so part. I mean, I, I really try to honor the piece of work that I'm responding to and they need to go together. And so I keep finding myself like, I, oh, you know, I like this poem, I'm gonna put it into this book and they never fit because they really are occasional to that piece and they're anchored to the piece. Um, and so uh, so the, it's an interesting thing. I haven't found where to put them yet um, in terms of beyond their publications at, at the museums themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, many poems about her. Um, and it's interesting. I think that there's quite a few poems in my book, Sharks in the Rivers, that respond in some ways to the work that she was doing at the time. But there hasn't been a direct one where I take like one of her paintings and then do an ekphrastic poem to it. And I think you've just given me an incredible prompt. And um, I think I will do that. Thank you so much. That's like a it's a it's a fall, a fall equinox gift. So thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I certainly hope it's not for worse. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing because uh, those of you who know, um, and because we're in DC, many of you might, um, that the, the, the laureateship is not something you apply for or seek. It is something you are named. Um, so it's not something that you're like, oh, I will someday do that. Or here's my, you know, here's my um, resume or CV. Uh, they they just call you. <laughs> and, um, and so I think that there's a part of me um, that has always resisted um, being involved in any kind of institution, <laughs> which is funny in this role to say that. Um, but you know, it's it's one of the reasons I actually haven't ever taken a full-time position at a university um, because I really have always maintained that I want to be an artist. I want to be an artist that makes things. Um, I teach occasionally, but I don't teach that much. Um, I really want to follow these this thread of my life, which feels like making poems. And that to me is still the essential driver of my being. And um, I will do my best not to lose that over the next two years as I serve until uh, May of 2025. Um, so I think that uh, for me, it is always about finding my own freedom and different ways to be free. The role itself has to be a nonpartisan role. Um, so, um, but I get to say whatever I want in poems, which is great because it's like, well, people don't understand poems. I'm like, okay. So, you know, I think that that's a, so, so really, I, I think I'm, I'm finding myself uh, as free as I possibly can be within my poems. Um, the biggest shift that I'll say, and then I'll, I'm sorry, this answer is so long. Um, the coffee just kicked in. Um, the, uh, the biggest shift is that I've never written um, as many public poems. I write very private poems. I write very personal poems. And those of you who know my work will know that about me. Um, and so it has been actually quite a challenge and really fun 
to write poems that I know will be read as a wider audience, right? Because sometimes as artists, in order to make anything, we have to begin by saying, no one will read this. <laughs> I will never give it to anyone so that I can be my most vulnerable and free as self on the page. And um, when you have something like a poem going to space, right, you know that there is going to be people that read it. Um, and so, or, or non-people that read it. And so, uh, so that, that, that's the biggest shift is, is learning and teaching myself how to write a public poem, which has never been some, something that's been part of my work before. Hi. Yeah. Hello. I, I chose to come to the mic and it was speaking from my seat. I didn't okay. even know there was a mic. So that's a beautiful thing. Hi. First of all, uh, thank you. I enjoyed your reading. Thank you. And what I'm uh, going to say is not to be negative about current trends in poetry, but just to get an explanation for you why this is happening. I grew up living, uh, learning and loving the old English romantic poets. Yeah. Wordsworth, Tennyson, rhyming. Mm -hmm. The word rhyming has disappeared now. Yeah. Uh, but, and there's a certain simplicity and romance about that. Yeah. which I feel has gone from modern poetry. I yeah. subscribe to the New Yorker mm -hmm. and I try to read those poems and I can't make any headway. Yeah. I, I actually submitted two of my poems which I wrote, which I thought were, and I got the fastest rejection in my life. <laughs> and I yeah. think if you, if you subscribe, if you send any poem to the New Yorker, which is rhyming, it will be rejected yeah. out of sight. Mm. So why is it that, I mean, a lot of uh, poetry these days, the free verse, so-called free mm. verse, mm -hmm. sounds like prose arbitrarily broken into chunks. And I'm not referring to what you have read. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a certain cadence, there was a certain rhythm to what you read. Yeah. Yeah, I really Why is this you. happening? And don't you think it's bad? Yeah. No, I I, I actually love this question um, for many reasons. Um, and I'll tell you that I rhyme a lot. <laughs> I actually rhyme quite a bit in my poems. Um, I use a lot of formal qualities. I use a lot of repetition. I use a lot of anaphora. Um, in fact, editors will say, you need to you do this a little less. And I'm like, no, more. Um, so I actually think there's quite a bit of form in my own work. And I think there's a lot, there's quite a bit of form in the free verse poems that are being written. I think that um, right now, and for every individual artist is different. I don't think we're ever collectively making one kind of poem. Um, but I think that the form often responds to the subject. And I think there is something that we're pushing against right now, which is trying to reclaim our own internal natural form, which isn't always in the musical realm. It's not always, um, uh, you know, the strict sonnet coming from a different kind of tradition. And I think sometimes when we look at those, um, the romance, you know, ro romance poets, we're thinking about this strict structure and I think breaking away from that has actually let us return in some ways to the natural wildness of the mind. And that what we're trying to do is pin the dragon of the mind to the page. And that to me feels in some ways more natural. So I actually think it's like returning to an original voice versus moving away from an original thing. I think that's the thing that we are breaking from. Um, that said, I think there are people who are writing incredible poems in form right now. Um, and um, Kevin Young uh, is the editor at The New Yorker, a dear man and a wonderful poet. And um, are you here? No. Okay. Um, and um, he is a good friend. And, uh, you know, he is also the director of the African American Museum down the street. So if you have any questions, you could just go walk and talk to him. Um, but uh, but no, I, I actually do think that uh, that rhyming is is more prevalent than one finds, um, and I also think that there is a naturalness and a movement um, that's happening right now with free verse poems. But it's still there. I think it's still there. Uh, yeah. uh, I just wanted to add that after many many years, I finally wrote my first free verse poem, 
and it was the easiest poem i've written oh. it took me 15 minutes because i didn't have to worry about stanza structure rhyming or anything oh. uh but i don't know i i think for me the effort in making the rhyme although you say it's probably unnatural it, there's some beauty in that and uh, it's like a song you you when somebody reads it there's a certain cadence and this uh, singing element to that. Yeah. I mean, I think there are people that are drawn to a formality and people who are not, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, the question was about haikus. Um, I actually, uh, you know, I, I think any kind of forms is that's how we all most of us poets learn to write in forms. Most of us learn to write a sonnet. We learn to write a villanelle. All of us know how to do it. Um, haikus are one of the first poems that often we learn to write. Um, and I think that anytime you give yourself constraints, you can make an incredible thing. Um, I love working in form personally. I mean, I have many, many sonnets. I have a crown of sonnet in my first book, which has a strict rhyme scheme. Um, you know, so it's it's out there. And I think that there's a lot of people who are doing that. Um, and for me, I think it's important to to work in both, to know both, right? You have to know how to do the original forms before you can break away and be free. Yeah. 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 You know, it's been amazing to to just be in the space with it and then also spend time, you know, looking at pictures because I couldn't just sort of stand there, you know, <laughs> as much as I would love to, but looking at pictures and really looking at how it was installed. Um, Vaughn and I looked at some of the original drawings and that was really fun. So it was also like the method of how it was made and noticing those circles, those grids, like how it was going to fit. And this, you know, also just thinking again about where it was and thinking about how its relationships to the capital, to me, were it was very fascinating because I think that that part was how I entered the poem. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Actually, my, my question follows up nicely from that. Uh, can you comment on, like, in terms of drawing meaning or feeling from art, uh, the relative value or perspective of being able to see it in person versus having to rely on images of it that you see? I always think you could, if you can, to see it in person. I think it's an entirely different experience, right? I mean, for, I, I, there's it is so wonderful to be able to travel um, the world through online galleries. And I love that there's an accessibility of that. Like that to me, I think is incredible. I'm glad we have it. There's nothing like seeing some, being in the space, seeing it, you know, because there's texture. You know, have you ever seen something online and you think, oh, yeah, okay, is it great? And then you go see it in person and you see the texture, you see the paint strokes, you see, you know, there's so much liveliness within the work. So uh, for me, it's a, it's an entirely different in person. You know, it's like, it's, it's uh, kind of like if you can play a song um, that you hear like just on an iPhone, <laughs> you know? And then hearing that song live in the room is an entirely different experience. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, how I wrote this poem, um, I write longhand. Um, I really believe in the process of writing longhand. I think it slows you down. Um, you can't write it in 15 minutes. Uh, it's a it's it's a very slow process. And so um, I wrote many, many drafts of it uh, in longhand over and over and over again in my notebook, um, getting things right, uh, figuring out the questions, what the questions were. Um, and uh, I wrote at home in Kentucky. Uh, in my home in Kentucky, uh, every poem I've, I've I've written two poems now in uh, the 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 office, the office 
of the poet laureate um and they are both about the capital so apparently i have to that's the only thing that looms over that office you know uh so this uh this poem was written at home in in real um sort of in a quiet space really looking at the world um i think we have time for one more yeah It, you know, it's very funny. Uh, the uh, <laughs> I am stunned. Um, no, I, you know, Dr. Biden has has read all of my work, and um, yeah. And uh, when I first met her, um, I asked her team, you know, what do I call her? And this, oh, they'll they'll say to call. She'll say to call her Jill. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. So um, I said, you know, Dr. Biden, it's so nice to meet you. And she gave me a hug and said, I've read all your, all your books. And so that was just a really beautiful moment. Um, and we actually had the opportunity to go to Mexico together. Um, and uh, we were on the dais with the first lady of Mexico, Dr. Beatrice Muller, who's also a teacher. Um, and all of these Poets were represented um, with all of the different native languages that are um, in Mexico, Puripecha, Nahua, and you know, and so so it was like seven different languages on this dais, and it was just so incredible. And um, Dr. Beatrice Muller um, read uh, my poems, and so it was just uh, th that kind of experience. So it wasn't directly like, oh, what does it mean? But just knowing that you were read and received by these incredible, powerful women um, was really remarkable. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for this. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.